name's Jonah, and today we're going to talk about how to maintain your mobile home and make it more energy efficient. We're going to focus on things that you can do yourself uh, that are simple and easy, but you can make sure your home is durable, energy efficient, and low cost to operate. Why don't we go outside and take a look at the features of the exterior of the home first. This is a typical example of a mobile home. Yours may not look exactly like this, but the features are basically the same. We have a pitched shingled roof. We have walls with wooden siding. And underneath, there's the floor structure that's often called the underbelly. In the roof, there's asphalt shingles on top that protect the home from moisture. Inside is usually a decent layer of insulation. And then inside the home is the drywall ceiling that you typically look at when you look at the ceiling. One important feature to watch out for are water leaks in, in a mobile home. Periodically check the roof shingles for any damage, any penetrations that don't have good seal, or any shingles that are cracking, cupping, or sagging sheathing underneath the shingles. These are all indications that there could be a water leak. You may not notice a leak inside the home, but you could see some evidence of perhaps staining on the ceiling, sagging drywall, soft paint. Uh, obviously if it rains, and it's dripping, you've got a leak. It's important to fix those immediately so that no mold will grow and the insulation is protected inside the ceiling cavity. You may be able to do that yourself if you're comfortable getting on a roof. It may take a professional to re-shingle the entire roof if it's that bad. Up to you. Your roof of your home may look different than this roof. Older mobile homes often have a rounded or flat metal roof. These are very important to keep sealed as they're more susceptible to water leaks. I suggest using a paintable elastomeric coating that you can find at almost any home center. You can apply it with a paintbrush or a roller, and at a minimum, I would recommend painting it on any penetration, all of the seams, and all of the edges around the home. But I would also recommend that if you have the money and the time to paint the entire roof. This does two things. It creates a much better seal for the entire roof structure, but it also reflects the sunlight in the summertime and keeps the house cooler. It's also important if your home has gutters to maintain the gutters. I would suggest cleaning out any mud, leaves, sticks, debris, and ensuring the downspouts are well connected and drain away from the home. The next feature of your home are the wall structure. Every home has the same wall structure, though it may look a little different on yours. But it has an outside siding. It has an inside finish, such as gypsum, wallboard, wooden paneling, and in between those layers is a wooden structure with insulation in between. Most of the time you won't be getting into that structure, but if you do happen to be doing siding repairs or interior wall repairs, make sure any damaged insulation is replaced and any penetrations that you can see daylight of are sealed. That will both reduce air leakage and make sure you have the most insulation in the walls possible. The last feature that's common to every mobile home is the floor structure sometimes called an underbelly. Underneath the finished floor are your floor joists, there's insulation, heating and cooling ducts, water pipes, sewer lines, and electrical lines. It's very important that that belly material is maintained and sealed. Oftentimes, a repair is done underneath and the weather barrier is cut open, the insulation is pushed aside, the repair is done, and then it's left open. So anytime you have any repairs underneath, it's a imperative that you put the insulation back and reseal the weather barrier underneath the home. I would recommend if you haven't been under in a while to take a look, make sure all of the holes that may be in the underside of the weather barrier are sealed and any insulation is replaced. The weather barrier can easily be patched with some spray adhesive or some caulk and some plastic sheeting material. You can cut the sheeting to size, spray the glue on the back of your patch and seal it up underneath. It's not the easiest job to do, but it's very important to make sure to protect your pipes, your heating ducts, and your floor from getting too cold. This is just an example of some fiberglass batting that's typical in a lot of mobile homes. You can find this at any home center, and it comes in any thicknesses, widths, and lengths that you may need to finish your product. It's fairly affordable and easy to find. Another very important part of your mobile home to maintain is the skirting. It not only makes the home look finished, but it protects the underside of the home from animal intrusion. Animals love to get under there and they can damage the insulation or the weather barrier, or they can just get trapped. 
This is very easy to find, though you may have to look around at a mobile home specialty store, but it's very common. If it's damaged at all, you can replace individual panels. If you want to replace the whole set, you can. Make sure that it's installed properly. In this case, we have some broken trim here. I would recommend replacing this trim piece so that water can't get under and other critters can't get in. It's really easy to remove. You just lift up on the trim and the panel slides out vertically. They come in pretty standard sizes, though they can be cut to height, and they come in different colors for whatever matches your home. Typical locations of the main water shutoff for a mobile home is often right behind the skirting under the home. You'll have to find out where it is along the length of the home, but it usually looks like this. It's often a colored handle in line with the pipe. In line means it's on, if you turn it 90 degrees, it is off. If you have any leaks that are major in the home, start here with turning the water off, then determine where the leaks are. It's also very important to keep this pipe insulated. You can see that it has black foam insulation completely wrapped around the pipe with tape holding it closed. That'll help keep it from freezing in the winter time. Many mobile homes have an evaporative cooler on the roof, sometimes called a swamp cooler. In this case, it's the fall and the homeowners have wrapped the swamp cooler on the roof with a canvas tarp. This is very important to both protect the equipment on the roof, but also seal the equipment off from any snow intrusion and protect the root ceiling inside from any water leaks. I'd recommend doing this every fall. In the springtime, it can be removed and the cover can be folded up and stored until you need it later. In addition to covering the swamp cooler on the roof, it's most important to turn off the water and drain any out from the evaporative cooler itself. You'll find a water line, usually a quarter inch copper or plastic tubing. This one is hooked right to the hose connection. And this supplies water to the swamp cooler when it's in operation. In the winter time, you need to turn the water off, drain the water out of the swamp cooler on the roof, and disconnect the hose from the swamp cooler to prevent freezing. Inside the home, there are a couple very important things to know for health and safety. One is where your circuit breaker is. This one happens to be behind a panel in the hallway. You may find one hidden in a closet, in the kitchen, but you should know where it is in case something happens with the electricity. If an outlet or a light stops working, the first thing to do is come to the panel and see if a breaker has tripped. Most of them are on, but this one appears to be in a tripped position. In order to reset the breaker, you turn it off first and then turn it all the way on. If power restores to the outlet and the light, you're all good to go. You may find that there's too many things plugged into an outlet. Oftentimes in our modern day, there's lots of electronics and it may draw too much power. Often culprits may be a window air conditioning unit or a space heater. If the problem still persists, you may have an electrical problem that a professional electrician needs to address. It is very important inside the home to not have any water leaks. Water can damage your floors, your walls, the insulation inside both of those structures. If left too long with a water leak, mold will grow and it will be a big problem. It's important to know where the shutoffs are at all of your appliances. Here are the two laundry shutoffs, hot and cold, and under the sinks, next to the toilets, and, the, uh, and any other fixture typically has a shutoff that you can access in a cabinet or next to the faucet itself. Here's an example of a typical shutoff to the hot and cold water under a sink. This is the cold and this is the hot. To turn them off, you simply turn the knob to the right. To turn them on, turn the knob to the left. Many mobile homes are fueled by natural gas. Certain appliances need natural gas to heat, such as a hot water heater or a furnace, sometimes a stove, even a clothes dryer might have gas. Natural gas is very dangerous if it's not contained. It often smells like rotten eggs or sulfur, and if you smell that smell, get out of the house and call 911. Otherwise, it's important to know where your gas shutoffs are in case you need to do repairs. Typically, there's gas lines coming into the appliance and a shutoff that's behind this pipe. Much like the water heater, this furnace is fueled by natural gas. It also has a gas line coming in this yellow handle is the gas shutoff. 
If you need to do any maintenance, you can shut the gas off here, but I recommend a professional for any gas work. This home has a gas range and oven. The gas piping is typically behind the range, as is the shutoff. Another very important feature for the safety of a home are both smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms. Every bedroom should have a smoke alarm in it, and carbon monoxide alarms should be located within 15 feet of any sleeping area. Some carbon monoxide and smoke alarms are hardwired into the home with battery backup. Many are just battery and they're screwed to the ceiling. These batteries should be tested once a year and you can test them by pushing and holding the button. If it beeps, the battery is still good. If it doesn't, the battery needs to be replaced. Another indication that the battery may be going bad is if you hear a beep every one or two minutes. That indicates that, yes, the battery may be bad, but it all could, could be the sensor is bad and the whole unit needs to be replaced. They can be purchased at any home center for fairly inexpensive costs and they're easy to replace on the ceiling. When a home has naturally gas-fired appliances, there's a chance that they could produce carbon monoxide, which is why it's important to have a carbon monoxide alarm. In a mobile home, you typically have a gas-fired water heater and technically they should be a sealed combustion unit that doesn't allow any exhaust gases to spill into the home. Often that's not the case depending on who installed it and when. In this case, this is an open combustion water heater, which means that it has the potential to spill exhaust into the house from this location. It's very important if you have one of these to adjust the flue and exhaust to be centered over the water heater tank to minimize the risk of spilling carbon monoxide into the home. You may find this water heater as this one is inside the home you may also find it accessed from outside the home. Both are important to have a well secure exhaust flue on top. Most water heaters have some insulation around the body. In this case, the water heater is inside the home and it doesn't need as much. If it were outside the home, I would suggest wrapping it in a blanket of insulation per manufacturer's instructions. Newer water heaters often come better insulated and don't require it. Other energy efficiency measures to make sure you check on your water heater are that the pipes are insulated, especially if it's outside to protect them from freezing, but also to keep it hot as it leaves the water heater. You can also adjust the temperature on the water heater. Typically, it's recommended to be approximately 120 degrees. You can adjust it by turning this knob. Some water heaters have a different setup, but they all have temperature adjustments. Much like the water heater, a mobile home furnace is typically a sealed unit. In this case, this one is, and it's a middle efficiency unit, very typical of mobile homes of this age. Yours may be older or newer, but they're all basically the same features, and they're typically sealed venting that shouldn't allow carbon monoxide to come into the home. Some furnaces have a pilot light that runs all the time. This wastes natural gas, so the more efficient units have an electronic ignition. Sometimes those electronic ignitions go out, the furnace stops working, it's time to call a professional for repairs. An important part about energy conservation with the heating and cooling system is the controls, called a thermostat. You can change the temperature by pushing the arrows up or down to whatever temperature is comfortable for you. This one happens to be programmable and you can set it to automatically turn up and down based on your daily schedule. The cooler you keep it in the winter, the more energy you'll save on heat. The warmer you keep it in the summer, the more energy you save on cooling. One very important piece to know about your furnace is a furnace filter. It protects the furnace from dirt and debris, but it also can get plugged up with dirt and debris and cause it to run inefficiently. I recommend checking it every month, maybe when your energy bill comes, and change it or clean it, if it's a cleanable type, when it's dirty. In this case, and in most cases, the filter is inside the back of the door to the furnace itself. This one has some tape to hold it in place. It's sized to cover the grill it's needed, and it is a disposable type. Doesn't look too bad, but it might be time to change. You can buy the same size, which is usually noted on the filter itself, or you can buy a cleanable type that you can cut to size, wash every time, and reuse forever. You can also get pleated types that do a little bit better filtration, but they get plugged up faster, so you might have to change it more often. The important parts are that they're the right size and that they're installed properly in the back of the door to not allow any dirt or debris to pass around it as the furnace is running. Besides a well-insulated home, it's very important to air seal the home. 
you can hire a professional to do an air leakage test and point out where lots of leaks are coming from, but most of the time you can figure it out for yourself. Common culprits are around windows and doors. If you can see daylight or feel cold air coming through around the door, I suggest using some foam weather stripping tape. It's really easy to apply and fairly inexpensive to get. In this case, the weather stripping is worn and not sealing well against the door. Weather stripping like this comes in many different thicknesses and widths depending on your needs. It's really easy to apply. You just cut off the section that you need. I'll do a small example. You peel off the backing and stick the adhesive side to where the door meets the jam. After installing the weather stripping, make sure the door still closes and latches. If you can still see daylight, you may need to double up the thickness or get a thicker tape. Another very common area of air leakage is around windows. For sealing up gaps and cracks around windows, I suggest an all-purpose acrylic latex window and door caulk. Cheap and easy to find. If you need to seal the outside from water, I suggest 100% silicone caulk. Caulk is very easy to apply. You'll need a few simple tools. A knife to cut open the caulk tube, and a caulk gun to apply. First, take the knife and cut the tip of the caulk tube at, way at the end. You don't want a big hole or you'll make a big mess. On most caulk guns, there's a poker that you can slide into the tip to break the seal of the caulk tube. Pull the caulk gun back, load the tube in, slide the plunger. When you're ready to start caulking, you squeeze the trigger and apply where you need to. When applying caulk, you don't want to seal the moving parts of the window, but you do want to seal where the window meets the sill or the jam. Point the tip into the spot where you want to apply the caulk. Gently pull the trigger until caulk starts to come out of the tube and slowly move along. You don't want to apply too much. Once a bead is applied, you can use your finger to smooth it out. If after caulking your windows, they still feel drafty, you may have air leakage coming from the operable part of the windows, which you can't caulk. An easy way to fix that, though temporary, is a window film kit. When it gets cold, you can buy one of these kits that are fairly inexpensive and they're easy to apply. They come with some two-sided sticky tape, and some plastic film. They come in many different sizes. This one is sized for two small windows. Measure and cut your plastic to size of the window perimeter. Then apply the two-sided tape around the perimeter of the window. Then stick your cut piece of plastic to the back of the two-sided tape, and the manufacturer recommends using a hairdryer Gently blow over it and it'll make a taut seal over the window. Even once the window is air sealed, it still may feel cold because glass is not a very good insulator. These curtains are okay, but they're not very thick. You can buy some insulated curtains that hang on a curtain rod and they add layers of insulation on top of the window itself. Another important feature of making your home energy efficient is water conservation. Water is expensive and it's a limited resource, especially if you're using natural gas to heat it up. An important thing to do is replace your old shower head with a shower head that uses one and a half gallons per minute of water or less. You can typically find that rating written right on the shower head. In this case, the shower head is old and needs replacement. Replacement is really easy. Oftentimes, the shower heads are only hand tight. You can just unthread it with your hand. You may need a wrench to give it a little boost, and if you do, I would back up the shower arm behind it so you don't break it. Once you unthread the shower head, use a little Teflon tape to seal the threads, replace the shower head by hand, and then use a wrench to tighten. Similar to the shower head, your sinks have aerators on them and they have 
flow ratings as well. You can reduce the flow of coming out of the sink without really recognizing a difference in the water pressure. It's easy to swap out. They can just unthread by hand. I recommend taking this into the store with you because there's many different types and you want to get the one that's exactly like this. Easy to reinstall. It just threads back in by hand. Another important thing about water conservation in the home is to make sure you do full loads of laundry and most of the time cold water is good enough, you don't need hot. One of the most expensive bills in the home can be your electric bill. There's a lot of ways you can reduce that. One of the biggest users of electricity is often your refrigerator and if you're going to replace your refrigerator, I would recommend getting one that is an Energy Star rated. Also important is swapping out old incandescent light bulbs and even compact fluorescent light bulbs with LED bulbs. There's millions of varieties. Make sure you get the ones that fit your fixture. Another big user of electricity in your home is the clothes dryer. The best way to conserve energy there is to hang your clothes outside when it's sunny and warm. In our climate, it's wonderful. But if you use your dryer, make sure to clean the lint trap after every use and every now and then, Disconnect the venting from the back of the dryer and ensure that's clean and clear. Every fridge works basically on the same principle, even with an Energy Star rated appliance. The back of the fridge has a coil that releases all the heat that's drawn from inside the fridge to keep your food cool. It often gets co covered in dust and dirt. It's important to keep that clean. So every so often, I recommend pulling the refrigerator out as I have here, using a brush that you can find at any hardware store, Gently clean off the dust and you can go over it at the end with a shop vac or a vacuum cleaner. Be sure to get the front and the back of all the coils until it's clean. You shouldn't have to do this often, but it's worth checking periodically and it helps the efficiency of the fridge. So those are the basic features of any mobile home and a bunch of great ideas to help keep the home safe and energy efficient. There's plenty of resources online to find more information about any of these topics and books at the library if, for more information to mobile home specific do-it-yourself projects.